Okay, well, there are all, all of the causes of what I'm conscious of are first unconscious, right? So, like, you know, I'm not aware of what my brain is doing at the synaptic level. But let, let's just be, again, I, I'm not even a dog, I'm not a, I'm certainly not a dogmatic materialist. I'm not, you know, like I, I can bracket the ontology here, but let's just talk in terms of materialism to, to and, and Dennett certainly is a materialist, right? So in most, yeah. most scientific compatibilists are, are materialists. So let's just grant materialism and its, its deterministic flavor for this conversation, right? It's like uh, my mind is what my brain is doing in this moment, right? So if, if I'm going to get to the end of the sentence, it's because, because of micro changes at the level of neural circuits that accomplish that, right? So the, the, the grammar of human English, uh, the, the grammar of human language, and in my case, English, is somehow encoded in the physical substrate of my brain as it would be in the physical substrate of a robot that was also speaking English successfully, although it just would be a very different kind of computer. So we, what we're talking about is information processing in a physical system. In my case, the computer is made of meat. In a, in a robot's case, it would be made of uh, silicon and the um, in neither case is there something extra which is emerging or being added that is giving a degree of freedom beyond just the the impressive complexity of the system in dialogue with its environment. I right? think so there we is. Have, we have, I think there is. I, let me what? like pinpoint precisely what I think that extra thing is. You know, cognitive control are includes things like implementation intentions. If we could build a program, a robot to have the capacity for implementation uh, intentions, and what I mean by that is error correction ability to right. take its current, because um, you're right, we, you know, in the moment, you know, um, we don't really have free will, but we have the capacity to shift our behavior in the future so that we can learn from our mistakes, so that we can even make moral reasoning decisions, you know, turtles, Chimps, apes, and robots right now don't really have a great capacity for um, moral reasoning about something, an action they already made, so they can change their behavior in the future. To me, mm. that conscious control is free will. It's free will. Um, but I, I, I don't think I, c I can convince you to use that label for that phenomenon. Is that right? Well, it's again, you're either changing the subject or like either you're going to interact with the thing people think they they really think they have, right? Or you're going to, or you're going to grant, okay, they don't have that. And then we're, we're going to talk about this new thing. I mean, so I, I like, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that there is a difference that's, that's rational to care about between, um, you know, voluntary and involuntary action or an ability to regulate emotion or not. I mean, there are people who have brain damage who, you know, just blurt out everything they're thinking they can't right. stop doing that, right? So and psychopaths like, like, are moral blind, morally blind, right? Yeah. So you sense, can. Yeah. There, there are people who are ethical, or people who are unethical. There are people who are sensitive to certain things and not. We, could, you know, you could be more or less intelligent. Like all of this, all of this is descriptively true of human beings, and none of it requires free will in the in the common sense to to understand or or to acknowledge. Um, so. And I so so I can cons I can conserve the data of human experience, all the while repudiating free will as a as a incoherent idea. Um, many people worry, but but the, the, what is truly novel about what I'm arguing for is that you can recognize this subjectively too. So the the, the only reason why we're talking about free will, the only reason why anyone cares about this topic is because people are having an experience, they think they're having an experience, of being a self that can author its actions. They, they, so the, the, the experience of having free will and the experience of being a self, being a subject in the middle of experience, um, being a thinker in addition to thoughts themselves, right, or fe feeling that one is those things, that's just, those are two sides of the same coin, right? It, it is, it, you know, people think that 
they are a subject in the middle of experience. They don't, they don't feel identical to experience itself. They feel like they're they're appropriating experience from a point of view internal to their bodies. I mean, they, actually, the truth is most people don't even feel identical to their bodies. They feel like they have bodies. They feel like they're in a body. They feel like they're a subject in their head most of the time, right? Mm -hmm. Now that is a, you know, meditation, successful meditation absolutely proves to you from the first person side, from the experiential side, that that's a false point of view, right? And that is the point of view that gives motivation to this claim about free will, because that is what it, that, that's how you feel when you feel you are the conscious upstream cause of the next thing you think and do, because you're not noticing that the next thing you think or intend to do is simply coming out of the darkness behind you that you f can't inspect. Right. And that it, and it is genuinely mysterious. And so like, so you take a moment of conscious deliberation. I could decide, well, um, uh, you know, I have a glass of uh, the simplest possible case. I have a glass of water on the desk and I could decide to pick it up and take a drink now. Right. Or I could decide to wait. Right. This is a, mm -hmm. this is a, the prototypical case of me being in the driver's seat. You know, I'm free to do this. There's no coercion. No one's, no one's got a gun to my head. No one's saying, don't pick it up or pick it up right or now. Or right? inner compulsion. Yeah. There's right. No, no I, yeah, I don't have some kind of, uh, uh, you know, compulsive water drinking behavior. Um, exactly. So it is, but, uh, you know, I'm, and I'm a little bit thirsty, but I can choose to resist my thirst, right? So I'm conscious of thirst, but then I can, I can consciously decide to resist. And that seems to be me prosecuting my freedom there, right? But the more you pay attention to what it's like to make that choice out of your own free will, the more you will discover that it is absolutely mysterious in every particular why and how you do what you do, when and how you do it, right? Like I, I absolutely, from, from subjectively, I have no idea why or how I do any of these things. And I have no idea why, why or how one particular moment becomes decisive, right? So like I could be telling myself, all right, no, you're gonna wait. You just drank, a, you just you just had a sip a few minutes ago. You know, you just, just wait, right? And then I think, well, actually, I, I'm just gonna move now. Right? No, 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 wait, wait. No, 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 I'm gonna do it. You, no matter how many times I go back and forth, right? Vetoing the decision that almost just got made and then breaking through the veto and then saying, oh, fuck it, I'm just going to pick up the glass of water, right? That every increment of that subjectively is totally mysterious, totally, and, and, the, and the thresholds that are being crossed or not crossed to, to make a, a thought or intention behaviorally active or, or insufficient to provoke behavior, right? All of this is totally compatible with some guy, some evil genius in another room, typing in the instructions to my completely determined and and coerced brain, you know, in this case using synaptic, you know, potentials, but in the case of a robot using the, whatever code the programmers put in there, um, it is, I there is, I am a puppet who cannot see his strings, there. Right. No matter how. And, and again, I'm not none. None of this is to deny that certain outcomes in life are better than others and worth wanting. None of this is to deny that there are ways to get what you want out of life and ways to fail to get what you want. None of this is to deny that there there is just a, a, kind of a vast landscape of, of experience. And we need to navigate toward one part of it so as to be happy and functional. And we should avoid navigating to another. We should avoid being captured by another part, which leads to, you know, the, the worst forms of misery. All of that's true. And all of, we can we can talk about, you know, how to do all of that. And all of that includes the prospect that people can learn, people can improve themselves, people can can, uh, you know, it's like first I, first I didn't know how to play the guitar and then I did. And there's, a, there's a pathway between point A and point B, right? All of that's true. None of it requires free will and none of it requires that we overlook the, the absolute mystery of our subjectivity, of our conscious subjectivity in each moment. 
right? Like it is, it is just totally inscrutable. Yeah. Every part of this, like, like literally you don't, you do not know what you will think next, right? In what sense is that a basis for free will? You do not know what you will think. You do not know what it will take to make it behaviorally active. You do not know, you do not know what is happening when you're second, second guessing the thing you just thought, and that becomes behaviorally active. You don't, if something in you then just suddenly pulls the brakes and says, no, 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 I'm not, I can't say that. You don't know why that happens when it does and when it works, when it does and when it fails, when it does. All of this is mysterious. A not just a little mysterious, a hundred percent mysterious, right? You have no insight into it. Like this, like the next thing, <laughs> yeah. like, 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 like the, so the, insofar, like the, the laughter, where did it come from? Right. I agree. Right. I agree. Okay. You're making, you're making good points. And, and I don't think what you're saying is wrong, but I think you're confusing a, the hell. what it is to have no free will. So I think you're confusing the hell out of people because I think that you made great points that the kind of free will that matters to humans, we have all of that, you know? And I think that's in, uh, an interesting pro – I, I see the difference between our projects all of a sudden because I don't think either of us are saying anything that's factually incorrect. I think that, you know, I try to – every day I try to like show people, you know, the kind of free will that matters to you as a cybernetic system. You know, you're taking like the ultimate universe perspective. But from like a cybernetic perspective, all we have are our stating uh, – our initial – I'm, I'm uh, also taking the subjective so, – so it's just not true that people understand this. Almost no one understands this. Dan Dennett does not understand this. He that's a big claim. Does, <laughs> that's a big obviously claim. doesn't understand this. He obviously feels like a self, right? And that's the that is the string upon which all of this controversy is strung, right? If you feel like me, right? That like most of the people listening to me right now are thinking, mm -hmm. "What the fuck is he talking about?" <laughs> I can like, but. Well, here's what I'm not, talking not about. Not my audience. Not my that, audience. That, that yeah. voice in your head. They get it. Yeah. That says, well, what the fuck is he talking about? Yeah. That that feels like you. That isn't you. Right? Like that is that's not a self. What do you mean that it's not thought. you? It is that's it's you. Thought. Again, no, it, you're it, you're a dualist no, when you no say that. Than, it, it's no more you than than the bead of sweat that that drips down your forehead is you. It is an object. It is an no, object. No, I disagree. People don't identify themselves with their hand, but they identify themselves right. with their conscious desires and motivations. So we can have gradations of things that people, parts of our body that people identify themselves with. From, certainly, from the, point, from the point of view of consciousness, there's there's simply consciousness and its contents. Like like I'm not saying that there aren't important distinctions in terms of what causally follows from certain contents. I mean, like the the, the bead of sweat is a is is truly epiphenomenal for any any other any project I care about, right? So yeah. it's not going to get a lot a lot of things done in the world, and and my thoughts might, but right. there's no causal thoughts. property of the sweat to like being able to uh, right. realize your lo loftiest ambitions in life. It's true, it's true. But I mean, take my loftiest ambitions, right? Like like there there are. And this is why the this is why the concept of free will makes no sense. So, so let's say I. Here's a project to which I could be purposed, right? I could decide that I want to become a a classically trained musician, mm -hmm. right? And there there are people who have given their lives to that project, right? Just ab from from the earliest years of their lives, right? As you know, um, and then there are people who late in life presumably decide, okay, I've done a lot of things, and I know I'm not going to be, I'm never going to be Mozart now, starting at, at in my fifties, but I, you know, let's just see what I can do here. I, I really, I really want to do this, right? This is what I love. What I love more than anything on earth is classical music, right? I love Bach more than anything, right? Okay. I just, w that's true of somebody. None of that's true of me, right? Why not? Why don't, why don't I care about Bach, right? Why don't I care more about classical music? Why, when I, when I do listen to music, why is it almost never classical music? Right, that all of these things have reasons. They have explanations causally. Right, some some in my corner of the universe, classical music is just not that interesting. Right, it's but not still, that it's not. Th it, those it, are the it, things that make you who you are, though. Even if oh, you don't know why they were caused by oh, okay. environmental and biological uh, confluence. 
Cram oh yeah, yes. Okay. So so it's deterministic. It's random. It's something, right? It's some pattern of causation, right? But so what does it mean to say that I am free to take a deep and and uh, really uh, all encompassing interest in classical music right now? Like I'm free. No one's no one's telling me you can't apply to Juilliard and and really just get into this. You know, it's like like uh, there's, there's, no one's saying no one's saying I can't give it a shot. You're not right? completely free, and there are constraints. But no, I wouldn't but, go but, and say you have no, no one, freedom. No yeah. Okay, yeah. but 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 clearly, I could I could decide to leave this podcast and spend the rest of the day listening to classical music, trying mm -hmm. to figure out which in, instrument I'm going to learn, finding a teacher. Yeah, yes, there are constraints. We've got a COVID pandemic that I'm worried about. So like I'm, I'm going to have Zoom classes now in the cello, right? I can't. I'm not going to do it face to face until I get a vaccine. Right? Yes, there are there are there are things in the world that I'm navigating around, but. There's nothing stopping me from just going all in on the cello from th this afternoon forward. Just dropping everything. I'll teach right? you. I play cello. Well, yeah. You do? Okay. I'll teach. Oh, right, my so grandfather was in the Philadelphia Orchestra for cello. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. all right. So so I, I I could I could absolutely do this. I am free to do this, right? Yeah. This is my this is the this is the stage upon which my free will is going to demonstrate itself, right? Right. Right, right. now. But what's the but, problem? What's the book? The problem is, I have almost no interest in playing the cello, right? Like so, like I can't. So so, but and and the fact that I don't is something that I did not author. It's a right? constraint. It's a constraint for sure. But well, we can one to one things. It's this a, is where free will. Talking, free will is not in the wanting. Free life. When you're when you talk about <laughs> devoting your life to playing yeah. the cello, not yeah. wanting to play the cello is is a little <laughs> bit of a constraint. Yes. No, it's a huge constraint. You're right. Yeah. You're right. But I think that you're not distinguished between first order goals and second order goals. And I think that what gives us the free will as a human, as species, what you asked me, what's that extra? It's the wanting to want. You know, it's it's our capacity to use implementation intentions to get out of the bed in the morning, go to the gym, even though we don't want to. I don't want to get up in the morning and, and go. I, I build a whole workout thing on my porch here. I don't want to do it, you know, but I my freedom lies in my capacity to use my consciousness and my and change my environment in all sorts of ways where it's easier, where the constraints aren't as big. You don't see that as an important part of free will that matters to people? Well, I just see no reason to call it free will. It's just so, so okay. when I when I, I see. Ins inspect what it's like to be me here, yeah. you know, again, I, when I think about myself from the first person side, and when I triangulate on myself and think about myself from a third person side, at no point does free will, any version of it, seem an apt seem apt, aptly applied to this situation. Like so, I'm free to play the cello. I am free to do it. Right. There's no question. So I, so yes, I can talk about the difference between being coerced and not coerced. That's a, you know, it's a political fact about me that I'm not coerced to play or not play the cello. Right. Um, it's a social fact. Uh, but you can still do it even I, if you're unmotivated. Right. I can't account for why I don't want to play the cello or I want so many other things so much more that I functionally don't want to play. I mean, the truth is, I want, I potentially want, an, given an infinite amount of time and an infinite amount of energy, well, then I, I potentially want an infinite number of things, right? Like all kinds of things are interesting and I would love to have all, all these skills that I don't have, uh, but I just don't have, I don't feel, uh, I, my, it's just not, when I rank order my priorities, you know, either consciously or, or unconsciously, I mean, and there can be a difference there. Obviously, you know, we can we can think we want certain things and tell other people we want certain things, but act as though those things aren't you know, anywhere near the top of our, our list of wants. Mm -hmm. um, but I have no idea why I don't like classical music more than I do. I have no idea why. And, and I do have actually I do have the second order desire. I wish I liked it more than I like it. I mean, it, it would be, it, it, it's more. I'll teach you. I'll teach you. Yeah, it's like I would be. I think I would be a, a less of a philistine <laughs> if I if I knew more about it. You know, I wanted to know more about it, appreciate, and, and certainly if I could play, you know, the cello, that would be um, a wonderful thing to be able to do. Uh, and yet, I am as I am with respect to classical music. Now, if I if 
if I de- if I decide if well, just imagine, I decided by force of this conversation, you said something in this conversation that inspired me to mm. be different than I'm tending to be. Right, like this this really would be a the the um, really the, the the ultimate instance of free will because this would be a kind of you know just a, a, a surmounting of of all my prior tendencies into this new uh, uh, commitment, I could decide, you know what, Scott, you just, on the basis of this conversation, I'm going to take up the cello. Like right now, I'm going to do it. You inspired me, <laughs> right? Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah right? I see your point. Uh, so just email me. Gets, like, I want to g- give me the name of some someone who can teach me. And I'm like, I, like yeah. I'm shopping for cellos right now. Like, yeah. I, you know. Yeah, um, I get your point. When I look, when what would it be like for me to experience that that sort of that that awakening in my own consciousness that's aimed in the direction of classical music and cello mastery, right? Right. That would be totally compatible with the evil genius in the next room saying, "All right, let's we're going to give him the cello desire here. He's got, we're going to give him you know just turn we, 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 give him give, he's now going to be." Just fixated on on you know the difference between Mozart and Beethoven, and it's all like just going to download the 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 classical music infatuation program, right? Yeah, that would be what that would be compatible with. It would not demonstrate anything like free will. It, it, it'd be like, what came over me? You know, I've had I've had fifty three years to discover yeah. in myself a desire to play the cello. If I discover it right now. What the fuck has come over me, right? This this comes from outside of consciousness. This is not me. I see your point. I see your point. This is not me, right? But I'm still gonna, you know, because I I know you don't like. Let's just agree to disagree. So I'm really taking this seriously. I think that what people, you know, you're using these extreme examples that sound good and and they prove a certain point. But the point, not extreme examples. This is. Let me tell you what my point is. Yeah, yeah. Is, picking up a glass of water is not an extreme example, and not and extreme. To, extreme to, was to, not to the right word. I take back extreme. I take back extreme. You're using examples that um, that make you it sound like you've won an argument. But let me just say what what my point was actually this: people, mm-hmm. the cybernetic system wants to reach a goal that it desires. So you're right. You can pick examples where it doesn't. But let's pick you know within the realm of freedom of things you do care about and you are motivated for. Don't you think that's a sensible uh, sense of the term free will that you have the free will to make, you know, you want to write a book, you want to write the moral landscape part two, you know, uh, back to future part two, you know, what, um, and, and you write that book, you know, your capacity to write the book and to use your consciousness mm-hmm. to make that a reality to exist in the world, you don't see that as the kind of free will that people truly care about? Well, no, people care, yes, people care about realizing their goals in life, right? And there are causal ways to succeed at that and causal ways to fail at that, right? And that's all, it's like, yeah, so learning to play the cello is not gonna happen to me by accident, right? right? So my denying free will is not the same thing as endorsing fatalism where one would expect, okay, you know, I mean, th- this is this is how people misunderstand this criticism of free will. They, they think, well, okay, if, if I have no free will, then why do anything? Why not just wait to see what happens? Right. And so if I'm going to wait to see if I accidentally learn to play the cello, we know what's going to happen there. I'm not going to learn to play the cello. Right. Like so there is a the only way to learn is to to intend to learn, to practice, to seek instruction, all of that. Right. So people care about outcomes in life that are worth caring about. They want good relationships as opposed to bad relationships. They want to understand things rather than be confused all the time. All, all of that is but none of that requires free will to talk about, right? And that's um, ultimate free will. And, and behavioral regulation is part of it, right? Like again, it, it, there's a difference between someone who can can defer gratification for long enough to actually get something done, as opposed to just you know gobbling up everything in the refrigerator the, the you know the moment they it presents itself. Um, it, so it's it's all. Um, but again, all of that can be understood. There are there are genuine paradoxes here, which are interesting to think about, which have ethical implications, and which are completely ignored the moment you embrace uh, the compatibilist framing here. And are also again, and the subjective insight is completely ignored because 
what happens to you when you recognize that that free will doesn't make any sense subjectively or, or what has to happen to you in order for you to have that recognition is you have to recognize something about the way the consciousness uh, the way the way consciousness is and the way the mind is mm -hmm. and it's incredibly freeing to recognize that right and and to recognize that is the antidote to a tremendous amount of psychological suffering right I mean, so let's say I, let's say i do something that is incredibly embarrassing right you know like i, I say i I'm, I'm giving a public talk in front of 2000 people and uh you know i i spill my water over you know all of the actually I, i've done this i was at a public talk in front of 2000 people and knocked over a water glass and it just spilled over all the you know the the equipment that was you know connected to my microphone you know at, at that podium right right so um awkward what what reaction do i have to doing that right like like how long do i stay embarrassed for well there's one, one way of feeling about oneself and one's freedom to do otherwise and one's you know and just kind of the integrity of selfhood that um leads one to feel like fuck i'm i'm such a fool you know i'm just i'm th th like this moment says a lot about me right this is like how did i become such a schmuck who would get up for a public talk and knock his glass of water like and all these people see me they've seen me do it and maybe this is on video and fuck you know like, and then so like now open the 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 bottomless pit of self mortification and go as far down as you want right like that's that's a, a certain kind of person to be right you could also be someone who instantly notices that it's funny right like who sees it that'll who, be me that'll be me enjoys yeah. it enjoys it from the point of view of the people watching it and and you could ac actually have the internal lightness about oneself in the moment so that yeah. it's just you you realize you, you you have a good story to tell later in the day and your wife is going to laugh at it and all of this is just more comedy right like so that, that like like no problem right like that's a different sort of person to be that has its own consequences um but Another sort of person you could be is recognizing that that one in this case you didn't even you didn't obviously you didn't intend to knock the glass over. It says basically nothing about you except the 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 you know a, a failed moment of motor programming, and um, you know apart from your worrying that you might have some neurological disease that you know caused you to, to knock the glass over, there's really nothing to think about any longer, right? There's just no, if it just dry, you just like, is there something to dry up? You dry it up because you're, you're well-intentioned toward the whole project of maintaining the integrity of this institution. But there's, there's no self in the middle of this that just got exposed, right? There's just consciousness and its contents and you're free. You're like, it is, you're in a circumstance of total psychological freedom to just move on to the next moment without any rumination about the last moment and deliver the talk you were going to you you you're, you're going to deliver you're free to take nothing. that glass and move it out of the way so you're less likely yeah. in the future for exactly. it to spill yeah. there's some intelligent response to this but there is no mortification there's no there's no place for it to land there's just you are you the next moment is is the world is truly born anew in the next moment if you will only let it be, right? The, and and rumination and perseveration and these these this mechanism that, that is so common to just still be beating yourself your your non-existent self up over this last thing that happened, which you didn't, which you the self that is being beaten up didn't truly author because it just fucking happened, right? Yeah. Uh, that is uh, – there's a spell to be broken there and it can be broken. And when you break it, you don't know what anyone's talking about when they're talking about free will. I mean really, you don't you – you can know – you lose sight of the problem, right? And – but yes, but uh, there's one piece to add here because there are paradoxes that are interesting, the morally responsibility. interesting. Responsibility. The responsibility yeah. paradox is is real and I, I, I still don't know what I think about it. And it's just, and, and perhaps you've heard my example here, but it's like I when have. you, it's with, with, um, uh, and this is something like any kind of a written debate with Dan Dennett came up. Um, this, this idea of, you take a, the prototypical case of, of, um, kind of behavioral control of, of a, of a golfer 
trying to sink a short putt, right? Mm -hmm. And when you're a bad golfer and you fail to sink a short putt, well, you know, you know, everyone looks at that and says more or less, well, of course, you know, you're a bad golfer. And what do you expect? You're, you're going to make some of those. You're going to miss a lot of those. Right. But if you're Tiger Woods or some great golfer, you really should make that putt. Right. And it, it, it would it would seem like like, like that's it, it would seem appropriate to beat yourself up over not over missing it because, you know, you make a, a putt of that length, you know, 990 times out of a thousand times. Right. And so. What does it mean to say that you should have made that putt if you're a great golfer? Um, and that you know this, this is just an analogy that uh, you know this this the morally relevant analogy is like what what it what does it mean you know when a psychopath misbehaves you know, or someone with brain damage misbehaves? Well, of course, what do you expect? This is what people with the relevant brain damage do, right? They they they're not um, they're not competent. To be truly free to behave well, because they're 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 malfunctioning robots on some level. But when you take a a a, a truly good person or a comp a truly competent person who then does something horrible, right? And then re really misbehaves ethically. That person's really responsible. You know, that's like the the, the the true case of responsibility. But the the paradox for me is that the more you make that, the more competent you make the person. The more their failures to behave well become inscrutable, right? So the so you take the best golfer on earth, missing the shortest putt putt he's ever missed in his life, right? That seems to say almost nothing about him. That seems to say that seems to be an error on the part of the universe, right? That seems to that that seems to cry out for an explanation, which doesn't tell you he should have done otherwise it tells you that there was some noise in the system there was some neurological glitch it's like it's, whatever whatever happened there intervened it was it was is it was adventitious to his life like it, he's going to make that putt a thousand times in a row now what can we say about him based on the fact that he missed this one we can say almost nothing about him other than he was unlucky right? i think it's a good point so I, I want to acknowledge that uh, when i read uh, your paradox of responsibility i thought it was a really truly good point is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? For quite a lot of us right now during this coronavirus pandemic, we are struggling with our most fundamental basic needs, such as our needs for security, connection, and opportunities to master our work. I think all of us could use some therapy right now. I know I sure could, which is why I've really been enjoying working with a professional therapist at BetterHelp so I can realize the best version of myself even under the current circumstances. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, and you can start communicating with your therapist in just under 48 hours. Note that it's not a crisis line, and it's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. There is a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. In fact, the service is available for clients worldwide. What I really like about BetterHelp is that you can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as you often have to do with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is really committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily. Here's a recent one. Camilla helped me turn my life around. Everything has been so positive for me since our first session. Deep gratitude. I'm pleased to announce a special offer for listeners of the Psychology Podcast. You can get 10% off your first month of professional counseling by going to betterhelp.com slash psychpodcast. That's better H E L P slash psych podcast. Join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. I'd like to take a moment to talk about one of our sponsors, Monk Pack. They make snacks that contain just one gram of sugar, two grams of net carbs, only 140 calories, and they're keto friendly. 
I'm really glad I discovered Monk Pack granola bars because it's hard to find snacks that are low in carbs, keep me full, and actually taste good. I didn't think I'd find a granola bar that would satisfy my midday sugar craving or even breakfast when I'm trying to keep it quick and simple. But Monk Pack Keto granola bars are so filling, have a soft and chewy texture, and come in several delicious flavors like coconut cocoa chip, honey nut, and blueberry almond vanilla. These bars are great for anyone following a keto lifestyle, but also they're the perfect snack for anyone who's trying to eat better or cut back on sugar and carbs without sacrificing taste. My favorite flavor is maple pecan, but you really can't go wrong. They're all so good. And they also happen to be gluten-free, grain-free, plant-based, and non-GMO with no soy, trans fat, sugar alcohols, or artificial colors. You really can't beat the taste and nutrition in these bars. And if you buy them online, you can avoid another trip to the grocery store and get Monk Pack delivered right to your door. These bars really are perfect for a quick breakfast, a snack between Zoom calls, or a late night treat. Try it for yourself and you'll see. We have a special deal for our listeners. Get 20% off your first purchase of any Monk Pack product by visiting monkpack.com and entering our code PSYCHOLOGY at checkout. And Monk Pack is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% satisfaction guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll exchange the product or refund your money, whichever you prefer. To get started, just go to monkpack.com. That's M-U-N-K-P-A-C-K.com and select any product. Then enter the code PSYCHOLOGY at checkout to save 20% off your purchase. Monk Pack, delicious, nutritious food you can count on. We thank them for sponsoring the podcast. It seems like we've got it all backwards in our society. You know, nice people, well-intentioned people who make little tiny mistakes are being canceled and the assholes are running the country. I don't know if you if you see any linkage here. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, you know, that's something I haven't linked those two topics, but um, yeah, I mean, there's an, as, there's an asymmetry there that many of us have found totally galling. And, and I think it's... I mean, it does. It it is relevant to connect them in that free will isn't the thing that the concept of free will or the concept that someone could have done otherwise isn't the thing that that uh, helps us understand what matters here. Mm -hmm. What matters is there are certain systems, uh, and you know, human and certain human brains are among these systems, uh, and certain types of thinking, certain ideologies, certain thought systems, right, that reliably produce harm that we should want to avoid because they make life suck, right? I mean, these are, these are, these are, these are um, disproportionately bad, even if there's some good to be found in there, the, 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 the bad outcomes are so reliably produced and they're so unsurprising that we should want to figure out how to, how to avoid all of that, right? And having a a malicious and uninformed and uh, uh, sinister and 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 utterly selfish person in charge of our country is a is a bad system, right? Like now, there's no free will. I don't. I don't you don't need to attribute free will to Trump. The, the idea that he could be otherwise, he can't be otherwise. Right, he's a he's a moron, and he's and he's a narcissist. Right, what do you expect him to do with with with, with the power of the presidency? Right, um, now he's not he's not as dangerous. He was not as dangerous as he might have been. He's not Hitler, right? But Hitler is another bad system that we should want to disempower, right? And certainly not em- work to empower, right? Um, but again, all of this is is susceptible to a a mechanistic interpretation. We don't want to put a bad robot in charge of our world, right? We don't want to Correct. code a, 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 a system of, of artificial intelligence that has bad ethics, right? But And we know that if we do, we're going to get bad outcomes. But um, again, there's no, and it is, it is in fact true. I mean, this is, comes back to the paradox. The better you, the, the more finely you calibrate any system, Toward toward good outcomes, the more inscrutable its failures to achieve those outcomes become. You know, if you, you know, it's just it's like if you realize if, if you have a a um, a robot that has a you know only a one in a billion 
error rate. If you experience a one in a billion error today, you know, when you're, you, when you're interacting with that robot, damn, that's surprising. And yeah. it, 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 and it's, and it's, it says virtually nothing about what the robot did in the past because it, it worked perfectly in the past. And it says virtually nothing about what it's likely future. to do in the future. Yeah. And you were, you and the robot were, were both unlucky today. You know, you, you got the one in a billion error, right? So, 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 so again, yeah. to, to, to remind people what the paradox is here, the more, the, the, the more you make someone seemingly responsible, really responsible for their actions, the more you make them the, as competent as they can possibly be in that domain, right? So, so that they can shoulder this responsibility of feeling like, God damn, I'm really culpable for my failures. Like, like I should have done otherwise. I should have made that putt, yeah. right? The more that the less it seems like it really reflects them, right? The, the more the more mysterious the failure is, and so it's 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 almost like an uncanny valley effect. It's like most of so, us who live most of the time in the uncanny valley of just the chaos of our of our imperfect calibration, right? That's the place where you can sort of heap claims of responsibility onto people and they seem to land. And my argument is that it's never to, to tell someone they should have done otherwise. Like, I mean, it, it, this is very clear in parenting. Like, I, you know, I have I have daughters who I'm not I'm certainly not browbeating about the illusoriness of free will. No, I'm trying to raise them to be competent, self-regulating human beings. Right. So when I say if I if I talk to one of my daughters and I say, you know, you really should have done otherwise, right? I mean, that's not a way I would put it, obviously, but yeah. but if that's the implication of what I'm saying, like the thing you, like, it'd be nice if you put your plate in the sink after you you, you were done eating, right? Like, 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 can you do that next time? It really is much more, it's, it's never a claim that in this instance, if I rewound the universe, they would, they, they might have done otherwise, right? No, this is a a causally determined uh, outcome uh, that is all was always going to be the way it was going to be, even if you introduce randomness, right? So there's no free will here, but it is a conversation about what I want them to do next time, right? And that is a that is and saying that is a further input into the clockwork of their lives, so that will change them. Ultimately, it will change them. Ultimately, if my daughters are going to become civilized human beings. They will not behave the way they did at you know at seven years old or twelve years old or you know when they're in their forties, right? Um, and those changes will be causally affected on the basis Absolutely. of demands imposed on them. But again, there's no n there's no place for the folk psychological notion of free will to land there. It's like it's you just, wouldn't give your daughter any credit if she became president of the United States someday. You would look at her not with pride because you'd say, "Well, she didn't, you know, ultimately cause that." Well, well, well. Honestly, so I, I do feel like pride is a is a is a virtue that has an expiration date in in a human life. I mean, I think it's developmentally there's an appropriate there's like a critical period where pride is not a a, a an ethical error or a um or a sign of psychological confusion it's actually it's it's actually something you want to to get into the code right so like i i, I would i love it when my daughters are proud having accomplished something that seems like a good thing psychologically but at a certain point i think you want you clearly want to outgrow it it's clearly it, it is a it is not a a durable basis for self-esteem. It's not a basis for compassion for oneself and others. It's um it is it it does re tend to rest on a confusion about just what it is you can reasonably be responsible for and what it is that it was just a happy accident, right? Um, and people take to, tend to take credit for the for for things that they weren't actually in control over, and and yeah. and uh, you know attribute um, their failures differently. Uh, so there's kind of a delusion built into it in the normal case. I mean, if you're depressed, uh, that probably flips, and then you then you're more realistic about about um, what was actually within your within your uh, purview to control. Um, but 
yeah, I don't, I don't feel pride about anything in my life now. I mean, I'm never, like I have all kinds of outcomes I, I prefer and sometimes I realize them and sometimes I don't. But, and, but, and so, so the, 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 the obverse of pride, of course, is something like shame. Again, shame is, is an important thing to be able to feel, but ultimately I think it, it reaches its shelf life. I think you want to be able to transcend shame again, not, you know, not too early. This is, this is an interesting topic. And again, I, and I'm not totally, I don't totally know what I believe about it because I, I think there's, there's, there's certainly a pathology in, you know, and a lot of danger on the other side of, of losing one sense of shame. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I, I do think ulti ultimately psych, you know, there's a psychological freedom in outgrowing pride and shame. And just seeing that there's just no there's no basis to feel either ultimately. You're there's just telling lot. yourself a story about the past in in both cases. You're, you're thinking thoughts in the present yeah. that nominally refer to the past, and you're and they're making you feel a certain way. You're feeling good about it's like you're watching a movie about your past, and you're being entranced by it, and it's kindling an emotional response that has a certain half life. Um, and it's incredibly boring. It's in the end, it's it's an, it's an incredibly boring thing to do with your attention. It's it's a it's a masturbatory in in the, on the pride side, the pleasure side. It's a masturbatory and self-directed, um, pseudo source of gratification, which divides you from it. it, leave, it, it uh, importantly, it, it 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 sets up a a. A, a system of comparison between yourself and others that ultimately is not a source of well-being, right? I mean, like, you know, if, you, if you're comparing yourself favorably to other people and feeling good about that, you know, then five minutes later, you're going to be comparing yourself unfavorably to other people who are do, doing yet more impressive things, and you're going to feel bad about that. Like, that, that pinballing between those two things is not the right algorithm to live a truly self-actualized life. So I do think both pride and shame ultimately get outgrown, but at what point? That's an interesting question. I love this transcendent view and also the idea that you, uh, the point that you make that about hate, you know, there's really, hate doesn't really have a, a place to program in the robot here once we uh, understand that there's no ultimate free will. And what I don't understand, though, is, you know, it, so your view, absolutely, and I loved your point about how it can increase sympathy for others when we realize, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, we're not um, always aware of, uh, or most of the time, we're not consciously aware of the outputs uh, or the in the inputs into our outputs. But what I don't understand is, is, is like, implying that in your own life, you you don't apply that when you talk about Trump. I mean, you get you hate you you get really angry, but you don't say well, well, that, things like we should have sympathy so, for Trump. Yeah, you know. So, uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, so so well, there's certainly moments where I'm 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 captured by by something that I find so despicable that I'm that I'm actually you know I'm blind to the to my own philosophy here. Like I'm just lo I'm I'm lost in thought. You know, I I'm I'm identified with 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 a moment of finding Trump despicable, say, and, um, yeah, so I'm just, I'm in the dream, you know, I'm, I'm asleep and dreaming and unaware. You're that I'm human. Yeah, You're yeah. Human. So, yeah. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a Buddha. Um, but much of the time a different thing is happening and it's not, it's not personal. It's not, um, it's not that I hate Trump personally. It's that I hate, and again, this is all slightly anachronistic because now he's no longer president. And so it's, I'm, I'm, basically never thinking about him now, which is wonderful. But it's not that I hated him personally. It's that I hated the fact of him, right? The fact that we made this sort of man president was so terrible. I mean, for, for all the things it said about us as a, as a society and all of the, the risks we were then running for four years to put something in charge of, I mean, literally put something in charge, someone in, in charge of our nuclear codes who couldn't figure out why we can't use nukes. We've got them. Why not use them? Right. Like, like take that one factoid about Trump that he had to be repeatedly admonished by his, his you know, joint chiefs, chiefs of staff that it was a good thing that we had reduced our warhead count from the 60s. And he asked, well, why, why don't I have as many? He, when he heard that 
you know, Kennedy had 10 times the number of bombs that he has, he, Trump thought that was a problem. Like, why, why can't I, why, why, why did he have more bombs, right? Like the guy was so dangerously ignorant of, in this case, just the, the game theory of nuclear deterrence and, and, and all, and all the rest, uh, you know, which, which are very lives and the lives of our children and the fate of civilization depend on someone not being that catastrophically ignorant about that thing, which, you know, which, you know, about which only he has the responsibility at this point for the next four years, right? So that fact alone joined to, as you said, 10,000 other facts about this man, That's right. right? Reliability. He's so, reliable. So <laughs> awful, right? Yeah. He's so reliably bad. That's right. As a That's right. malfunctioning robot, right? Right. That if we if we put we can a, predict it with ninety eight yeah. percent accuracy. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So it's, so it's not so like it's a, it's a little bit analogous to if we if we elected a rhinoceros mm -hmm. to be president, I'd be fucking tearing my hair out over how awful that is. At no point am I imagining that the rhinoceros can be anything other than a rhinoceros, and at no point am I imagine no point am I wishing the suffering upon the rhinoceros. I don't hate the rhinoceros. The rhinoceros just shouldn't be president of the United States, right? Like, like, like it's it, that's a catastrophe to do that. Um, and in some sense, we elected a rhinoceros president, and so I spent a long time complaining about that because of all the the things to which that was connected in, in our society and and in our possible future that were worth worrying about. I hear you, and I hope you understood my point too. You know, you know, you never you never said these words such as. You know, I think everyone's um, uh, coming from such a place of hate with Trump. You have to understand he doesn't have ultimate free will. And I think we need to have more sympathy for him like you would with a rhinoceros, you know, while still taking action to prevent him from ruining the world and pressing the nuclear button. I've never heard you like say that in a uh, in a sympathetic way towards Trump, applying your own principle. Do you, do you, do you see my point? Yeah. Well, 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 so I mean, Trump is someone – who is un I find it unusually hard to have to feel compassion for him yeah. because he seems he seems damaged in in ways that are that specifically render him impervious to suffering right so he's like not someone who who seems to suffer anything ever right now I mean, I'm sure he probably does but that that requires an extra act of imagination a free to will. imagine what, what he's like in the you know in the privacy of his mind when he's suffering. He actually, I mean, he doesn't seem comfortable. He doesn't he doesn't seem like he's he's got he has a nice mind to inhabit. But he seems to be missing a module right. that would would naturally provoke compassion. Free will. <laughs> well, no, it's not free. But it's not free will. It's it's just it's like he doesn't like. Does he care about? the relationship does he love people does he care about like when someone close to him dies does he feel grief mm. i don't i don't know actually he seems like he he might be damaged in precisely the way that would that would prevent someone from ever shedding a tear about anything right like like he's a car, he's a kind of cartoon for real right it's not it's not just that i've made him a cartoon yeah. because i don't know enough about the man or i or, or because i i find him so despicable uh, that I'm just not disposed to think clearly about him. He actually does seem like a, a, a very unusual person to me. Um, and I wouldn't say this about even objectively worse people like, you know, Osama bin Laden, right? Like Osama mm -hmm. bin Laden seemed like a much more normal person to me than Donald Trump, uh, albeit one who was committed to specific ideas that I found much more reprehensible, was much more dangerous. It's a good thing we killed him. All of that, like, but much more. I understand his psychology much more than I understand Trump's. There's a Trump, randomness there, isn't there? There's a ma there's a malfunctioning robot like aspect to Trump, mm. where he's I mean, he's got he's got a few obvious pieces of his code. He wants to be rich. He wants to be famous, right? And then on top of that, he's just win. He wants like, to win. Yeah, he wants it. Whatever he imagines is winning, and um, but then he's he again. I mean, there's, there's, there's almost no reason to talk about the man now. But it's just mm -hmm. the fact that people the, the the thing that that got most under my skin 
was that half of our society apparently couldn't see what was wrong with him, right? Like literally, like they just couldn't see the thing I was seeing in every instance of of, of having, it was completely unmediated, uh, unmediated too. It's not that I'm believing the New York Times profile, credulously believing the libtard profile on him, and the man is being besmirched by a lying, you know, fake news media. No, no. Everything I feel about Trump was was fully communicated by seeing him at the podium talking, like like so. I, I it was unmediated, you know, and mm-hmm. and and in many cases, virtually unedited. You know, you sit down and watch two hours of Trump. That's who I'm reacting to, right? And and the fact mm-hmm. that half of the country felt there was, I mean, either couldn't see it or felt that, you know, it's upon seeing it, that's exactly who they wanted to be, to be president. You know, uh, that there was something, you know, crazy making about that because it's, it just was a transparent act of lunacy from my point of view. I mean, just like, okay, let's just drive, you know, human history toward a cliff, you know, as, as quickly as possible and, and see what happens. Right. It's like, it, it, it seemed like an act of chicken with, with, to be playing with human history. Um, and, uh, so anyway, I was reacting to that much more than than I was motivated. Because the truth is, I see like like I can I can I can have the reaction that the people who like Trump, I can actually run that reaction in emulation. Like I can see that he has moments where he's genuinely funny, genuinely charming, genuinely charismatic. Like I like I get that right, and so and and I can feel my monkey brain light up in precisely the way every, everyone else's brain lights up when someone who is charismatic and, and charming and funny and taking risks shows up, right? So, you know, like when he's at the debate and he said, you know, he's, he says that completely, you know, he's, he's challenged by um, Megyn Kelly for all the heinous things he said about women, you know, in his history as a buffoon. And he says, you know, only Rosie O'Donnell, right? You know, and that is a huge laugh line and it completely undercuts everything Megyn Kelly thought she was going to achieve in that moment journalistically, and it wins him the debate. Like, there's part of me that just finds that hilarious too, right? Like, so I get I get that. But to not have seen the bigger picture here and to not have seen yeah. that this man is actually a sociopath with respect to his ethics um, and to not have cared about any of that, right? To not have done the the moral arithmetic and imagine who you'd have to be to have run the fraud of Trump University and have de- and to have defrauded elderly people, to have encouraged elderly people to max out their credit cards, to get your fake knowledge at your fake, you know, your, you know, you know, scam university, to have been that, that one data point alone in his backstory should have been absolutely disqualifying. You know, like we should never have heard from him again after that. It's because it says so much about who you are and who you're likely to be in further moments. Like that's not just a missed putt. That is a million putts missed in a row, right? Like we, we know you can't play golf after you miss that many putts. Not even in a row, all at once, Sam, all at once. (laughs) I won't even say in a row. It's, it's, it's so much at once that you can't even focus on one at a time. (laughs) It's over. The conversation is over, you know? Yeah. Um, But so you don't hate him. No, no. In, okay. in 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 my in my clearest moments, I don't hate anybody. Okay. Like, I mean, and yet there are people who I would I would sanction that we kill. Right. right. It's like I mean, it's like again, it's not. I'm not right. a pacifist. There are people who should. It's like we, we, you know, we've invented guns for good reason, right? And it's to there are people who I hope cannot, I'm not one of them after this interview, by no, the way. <laughs> no. And I'm and I'm against the death penalty, right? So it's like once we yeah. have safely confined somebody. Yeah. Then there's no reason to kill them, right? I mean, then 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 that's a, a major ethical lapse. But no, there there are um, you know there are acts of self defense that are totally rational, and you know you know yeah. someone comes into the, your house and wants to kill you and your kids, by all means shoot that person in the head, right? I mean, like that is what guns are for, um, and you should do it. You should do it if it's a grizzly bear, and you should do it if it's a person who seems to think he has free will to kill you and your kids, right? So it's like that that's that that's morally uncomplicated in my view. But again, gotcha. hatred 
this is a, this is an asymmetry that I think you were referencing. Yeah, love and heat. Yeah. Pe- pe- people wonder, well, what about love? If people have no free will, how do you love anybody, right? And and this is a a, a beautiful asymmetry between hatred and love, at least in 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 my view, which is hatred really does require an an attribution to someone that they could and should have done otherwise, right? Like it's like you you believe they really are the authors of their bad actions. And the moment you find that they have a brain tumor or whatever it is that that is exculpatory, then you then you change your response. You think, oh wow, you know, I, I did hate Charles Charles Whitman for getting getting up on that clock tower and killing 14 kids. But once they performed an autopsy on him and found a a, a massive brain tumor pressing on his amygdala, well then, okay, then I recognize you can't hate the guy. He was unlu- he was unlucky as he was as, uh, as unlucky as the kids he shot, right? I mean, that's just that's terrible, right? Uh, on some level, that happens to everybody once you recognize that free will is an illusion. Um, but love doesn't require an account of human behavior in that way that re- that demands that people be the the true upstream cause of all of their actions. Love just requires that you really just two things that you that you care about the difference between suffering and happiness, right? For for the for yourself and others, right? Like you you want people to to be happy, and that is really the the what it is to love someone. You want them. You 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 want to relieve their suffering. You want to to maximize their happiness, and additionally, you take a certain you you find a certain pleasure and well-being in their company, right? You want to be with them, right? So like you're in the presence of someone who you want to be with, who makes you happy and who you want to be happy, right? And you want to, and, and, that, and that, that positive social orientation and that direct enjoyment of the state of love in your own mind, that's what we mean, or uh, I would argue that's what we should mean when, when we say we love somebody. Um, and none of that requires a belief that they are the, you know, they pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps, causally speaking. Hmm. Uh, whereas hatred really does, on some level, like one, the moment you notice that. I mean, the, the example I always use is is of Uday Hussein because he's 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 not is it's not as hackneyed as referencing Hitler, but um, you know, you take a truly evil person who's done just objectively heinous things. And just walk back the timeline of their life. You know, it's just like you know, uh, you know, you take Hitler. Hitler, as a forty-year-old, was absolutely somebody who was just fit for nothing other than a than a, a bullet. But you know, walk him back to when he was four years old. He's just a little kid who's going to become Hitler, right? But he's an unlucky little kid. He's got bad genes, or bad parents, or a bad society, or something's going to beat him into the shape we now recognize with the bad mustache and the and and the the uh, <laughs> the dangerous beliefs right and um at what point along the way did he get free will well at no point so at what point along the way are you just you become justified in hating him and fe- and and feeling no compassion for him you know i would argue at no point although it admittedly it's very hard once he becomes an adult to find any kind of basis for compassion, but he didn't make himself, you know, and, um, you know, I certainly, you know, I certainly would have, uh, killed Hitler had I could have, uh, um, at any moment along the way to, to, to stop his, his real harms. But it's an interesting question. Like this is, this is, this is a Ricky Gervais bit, right? Like if you get get into a time machine and go back to kill Hitler, what if you land back with him as a kid? Are you going to kill the four year old Hitler? Right? Would you have killed Trump at age four? Well, no. Well, no. But I mean, it's 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 easy. It's I wouldn't say I would have killed Trump at any point, but it's easy to say I would have killed Hitler at a certain point, given the harms he caused, but. Killing the four-year-old Hitler seems like you know an act of pure psychopathy, right? He's a pure, four-year-old kid who hasn't pure done anything. cruelty, pure cruelty, right? Yeah, right. So there's so at no point is com, is compassion yeah. unjustified, and at no point is hatred justified, in my view. And every so and so the, so then the question is, 
at in the, in these occasions where violence seems not only justified but necessary, right? Mm -hmm. Killing Hitler, you know, at the, you know, assassinating Hitler when it could actually do the world some good. You just you just never need hatred for that to be motivated, right? Like it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't require but but hatred does require a false ascription of authorship or and and human agency. And that's why and that's why I would say it, it is possible to get rid of hatred without getting rid of love psychologically. Well, I like the spirit of a lot of what you're saying and even your your teachings and your um, and the whole point of loving kindness meditation. You can have love, you know, Sharon Salzberg beautifully shows how we can mm -hmm. meditate on our enemies, right? You know, um, you know, that we can wish them well because if they are clearly Trump wasn't well. You know what I mean? Like, like if we right. wish Trump well, that's only going to be the benefit of the world as well. Yeah. 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 You know? So I really oh, yeah. love the spirit. Yeah. I love that. No, and I love these higher principles. Are you listening to this episode and thinking of a bunch of questions you want to ask me? Or maybe you just want to jump into a discussion of the topics we're covering on today's episode? Well, now's your chance to interact with me more directly over at the Stereo app. Every Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific Time, I go live on the Stereo app with my friend A.J. Jacobs, a best-selling author and lifestyle experimenter. A.J. and I discuss the most recent episode of the Psychology Podcast and take listener questions. Last week, we were blown away by the insightful questions from listeners. Note this is exclusive to the Stereo app. With Stereo, you can be your very own talk host. Or if listening is more your thing, you can jump on our Stereo Talk and ask all those questions you've been dying to ask. All you've got to do is download the Stereo app and follow me at Stereo.com slash Psych Podcast. Then just join us on Sundays at 5 p.m. Pacific time to join in on the discussion. Again, download the Stereo app and follow me at Stereo.com slash Psych Podcast and join us on Sundays at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Once you sign up, follow me so that you can get notified every time I go live on Stereo. See you there. Um, okay, so the is all to say you... you have an interesting uh, discussion. You say the separation between science and human values is an illusion. Now, why uh, you, for the first time in history, thousands, you know, hundreds, hundreds of years, no one's been able to put a guillotine on the on on Hume's guillotine, <laughs> and and how how are you able to finally take us from an is to an ought? It, can you walk me through the logic of how you think that that's possible to go from facts to values? Well, I think it is a trick of lang people are getting hung up on language. It is a kind of a semantic uh, distinction that I just don't think we need to be taken in by. Um, and it really is not something that Hume himself went deeply into. I mean, it was it's much more of an aside uh, in his writing, uh, this distinction, and it's been blown up into like this foundational notion of of metaethics somehow um, that you can never get an is from an ought. Um, I mean, the there are a few ways to see what's wrong with, with this. I mean, one is you can never get an is without certain oughts, right? You can never make a factual claim about the world without following certain uh, intellectual, logical, rational oughts or values, right? By, by buying into them. It's like, what, why, should, why should we value evidence? Why should we value logical consistency? Like, like if someone doesn't value logic at all, what logical argument could you invoke so as to convince them that they should value it? And if someone doesn't value evidence, what evidence could you provide to suggest that they should value it, right? It's just at a certain point, there, there, there are certain axioms, certain things are axiomatic, and that's not a problem. We can't do science without it. We can't do math without it. We can't do anything without it. And yet people are acting like if you need any of that to get your morality started, there's no such thing as morality. Right. They, they change. There's a double standard here that we should notice. Like there are people are finding people take the, the fact that there can be moral controversy has convinced most people that there's no such thing as objective morality. But there can be controversy about anything. There can be fa the, 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 there can be controversy about about physics. We would never move from that. The mere fact of controversy to to to, cl to the claim that there's no objective physics. Um you know the fact that you know the, the fact that the Taliban disagree with us about morality is invoked as a reason to believe that morality has to be relativistic. There are no universal truth claims to be made about right and wrong or good and evil, because 
millions of people over here don't agree with us. Well, millions of people over here don't agree with us about physics either or evolution either because they don't, they're just – they're not adequate to the conversation, you know, uh, because they're just – they're they're obscured by they're, – they're, they're mired in other belief systems. Um, not, that, that never causes us to wonder whether or not biology may just be made up or a cultural construct or, or relativistic or – right? Which is – unless we're – haven't been completely – Unless we've been completely taken in by some kind of postmodernism, but um, so th that double standard is worth noticing. You, you can't get to facts without certain, without indulging certain values, at least implicitly. Um, but you know, I, I usually I just find a different starting point, which is okay, fine. Let's say there's no such thing as oughts. There's no shoulds. There's no there's no morality. There's no values, right? Um, let's just deal with a universe of facts. Let's just start there. Well, it is a fact that we live in a universe where there's a a vast landscape of possible experience on offer, and we have a navigation problem, right? Like we can we can navigate toward places on this landscape that are more and more sublime, where you know, hairless apes like ourselves have better and better experiences collaboratively, creatively. We we produce, you know, brilliant works of art and have the free time to enjoy them. And we have epiphanies that, that, that you know, cause, uh, you know, psh, the, the hair on the back of our neck to stand up, not from fear, but from, you know, the, the rapture of just, just how beautiful the cosmos is, right? And we can have, and we have no idea how good all of that can get, right? With like the, the we can, we genuinely cannot see the horizon line there, but we just know we can push into this area where cooperation and and uh, curiosity and joy and loving kindness and all of this just gets like just gets tuned up more and more and more, and the music gets better, and the and the and the people and People like myself who don't yet understand how good music can be learn more and more about all that and get better to get more adequate to that conversation. Um, and then over here, we can have failed states where sadistic monsters torture people for pleasure and uh, nothing uh, fun happens at all apart for uh, just – you know, more creative sadism uh, and the benefits thereof, you know, accruing to the few creative sadists, sadists who get to uh, stay on top of that heap of misery before someone figures out how to murder them and, and, uh, and, the, and the cycle continues, right? And then, you know, the, and there are, you know, the, over here, there are cures for diseases because we have the free time to find them and we have the, the, the insight into the, you know, the, the mechanism that would allow us to find them. And we get vaccines quickly. And over here, people don't even know the germ theory of disease and they kill people for witchcraft and, and you know, cut out the tongues of blasphemers, uh, you know, because they're, they think that might be a cure for the, the bubonic plague as we did for mm -hmm. centuries in Europe, right? So there are two very different attractor states on this landscape uh, that we, we already know a lot about because we've lived in both of them uh, sometimes for centuries. And we have a navigation problem. We can, we, and and all of this again. This is this is all. These are fact-based claims, right? About how to move in this space. There are right and wrong answers about how to move. There are, and and the, and the, at every level at which we are gathering human knowledge, there are right and wrong answers. There are genetic things that determine, you know, where we where we're inclined on this landscape. Um, there are environmental aspects to this and all of this can be, you know, th th that broad strokes distinction can be, can be defined and understood at every level that we have a specific science or a specific almost science that addresses it. So we're, we're talking about the truths of physics on through biochemistry and, and, you know, uh, neurophysiology and psychology and sociology and economics and all of it. Right. Any place where we're going to make a fact based distinction about anything is potentially relevant to how we navigate on this space of possible experiences. So 
we have not introduced morality yet. We haven't introduced any oughts yet. Um, and so then, and we don't even have the word should yet, right? Now let's invent the word should, right? What does it mean? What should I do? What should we do, right? I would simply claim, this is the only thing you have to grant me in order to get my moral worldview booted up. All you have to grant me is that the word should, if it means anything at all, it means that we should avoid the worst possible misery for everyone, right? If we should do anything, we should do that. Every, anything else on this landscape is better than this one place where it's true to say that any conscious system that can suffer is suffering as much as it possibly can for as long as it can without any good thing coming of it, right? There's no silver lining to the suffering. You know, we've created computer systems that are just hell realms where conscious computer programs suffer immeasurably for an apparent eternity, right? Everything that can suffer is suffering the most harrowing and pointless misery it can possibly endure for as long as it can possibly happen, compatible with the laws of physics, right? That's the worst possible misery for everyone. If anything is bad, that is bad. If the word bad means anything, okay, it doesn't yet, we haven't invented the word bad yet. Now we have. What does it mean? If it applies to anything, it applies to that. What does good mean? Good means good, the direct, where are you going to point toward the good? You're going to point away from the worst possible misery for everyone. Anything is better than that. And now then the question is, how much better does better get? Well, over here, we've got a, a, a beautiful global civilization figuring out how to colonize the galaxy based on environmentally sustainable, you know, uh, you know coll collaborative principles that are just redounding to the advantage of almost everyone. And uh, they're curing diseases as quickly as they crop up. And it's just, you know, uh, and they're fast completing a, something like a, 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 a mature psychology of human self-actualization. And it just it's like basically the entire world has become Esalen Institute on its on the most beautiful afternoon it ever enjoyed in, the, you know, the, in the summer of love. Right. Right. That's the worst day anyone has for the next thousand years. Right. That's a pretty good planet to be on, right? Certainly better than the worst possible misery for everyone, right? Then, the, so so all the people who are who are getting wrapped around the axle of is and ought are saying, "Wait a minute, but is the is the worst possible misery for everyone really bad? Sh sh really, uh, should I should I should I really avoid it? Who are you to say, philosophically?" that that uh, you should avoid the worst possible misery for everyone, or you should actualize a galaxy full of 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 um, uh, amazingly happy conscious systems. Um, and that's just a it's a misapplication of language. It's just if the word if the word should means it's the, the place you're standing, so as to have the pretense of doubt about what those words mean, Right. That like the, the place you're standing to say, well, is the worst possible misery for everyone really bad? Might there be something worse? Right. That is that place doesn't exist. If you if you understand what these words mean. Right. If you're actually running them in anything like a kind of emulation so that you're, you're understanding them, it should be obvious to you that that's not there's no place to stand from which to do that philosophy no i mean like a much a much crasser but also emphatically convincing uh uh framing would be okay put your hand on a hot stove and then tell me about your philosophy about whether or not that is bad and worth avoiding i'd like to double click on that example though Go for it. Because everything up to that example, I was with you. And then, you know, the collective well-being. But once we get to the individual level, you know, I right. the way I think about it is that there's no should without an in order to, which is a goal. If someone says you should do X, that necessarily implies that you should do X in order to get Y. There could be no a should without reference to a goal. 
Now, well, what, what if, if what, if, what yeah. if the goal is to avoid the worst possible misery for everyone? Then that's a good point. But what if that's not your value? So what if, uh, or or what but if? How could yeah. it not be your value? Well, what if, there's one could conceive of a situation in which suffering at an individual level is what will lead to a greater good for everyone. If your value system is that greater good that you're talking about, couldn't you make the case you have to do sucky things sometimes in order to get oh, yeah. there? Yeah, yeah, but, so but so we're agreed on just, that. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there are trade offs, and and there are, and there are forms of suffering that have silver linings, right? I mean, that's why I'm careful to define the worst possible misery for everyone as 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 really the worst possible misery for everyone. But if you're if you're going to talk about, you know, any pr project in life that is hard that that can't be achieved, but for hard work, you know, i.e., some measure of suffering. Um, yeah, then those that's just, that's that's easy to understand. I mean, there's there's sometimes there's some things that suck, and nothing good come from them. And there's some things that suck, but they're on their way. Suck is a value me. judgment, though, isn't they're, it? They're, well, <laughs> the no, word well, suck it, itself. Is, no, but they could be in They could be well. No, there's there are framing effects, so that there are things that are unpleasant, but framed a certain way. We actually kind of like them. This is a kind of it's within the range of unpleasantness that we actually like. Because we know what it means, right? So, like a good workout is is my is the, my favorite example here. It's like, I like that. Like once you, once you learn to love lifting weights, that physical stress, which if you felt in another context, if you woke up in the middle of the night feeling what you feel when you're doing a you know the the heaviest deadlift you can you can you can accomplish, well, you'd think you were dying, right? You'd be terrified. You'd call nine one one, right? Like, like, like that's a medical emergency. But because you're in a gym, getting stronger, you actually like that experience, right? Um, so that's, but I, you know, that's that is interesting psychologically. But that's not a counterpoint to my argument. That's just, it's just, in fact, true that the cognitive frame you put around certain sensory experience matters, but it's. And it's it's also true that certain good things in life can only be accomplished by going through certain hard experiences, right? And it may it may be true, both individually and collectively. And this, this is why my moral landscape analogy uh, could be relevant uh, here on this question. You know, it, it, it just imagine a landscape where there are peaks and valleys, and the peaks correspond to increases in in well-being you know individually and collectively and let's, let's take a collective moral landscape for this argument so we're on and and you know with the, all of these all of the, the landscape disappears into the mists beyond which we can see so you never quite know you're on a peak right like there's never maybe there's maybe the peaks go up infinitely we don't know but we just we're on a high spot we know we can move higher and things get better and better this is you know, things get happier and happier for all of us or most of us um, or us in the aggregate. But there's – and we know what it's like to go downward and things seem to get worse and worse. Well, it may in fact be that there's a we're, – we're just on some local maximum. But the way to get to a much better spot, a much higher spot on this landscape would require a collective descent into some kind of valley, right? Like where, where things actually will get worse in order for us to get better. It's like you do have to rip the band-aid off and that sucks, but you have to rip it off. And so and, and that may be true of certain things. Like what if what if climate change what what if our solution to climate change is absolutely necessary but actually painful economically? Now I'm not convinced that's the case, right? I'm not convinced that we're we we need to make significant sacrifices. But what if it's that's just an accident if that's true. What if we lived in a world where we're on a collision course with something truly horrible, and the only way to get off of it is to make a major sacrifice that diminishes the that noticeably diminishes the well-being of more or less everyone for a generation. It's totally possible that we could be if we're not in that situation now. It's that's a, that's an intelligible situation to to be in. That would be an example of like, okay, this is going to suck. But we have. But here's why we're doing it, and and it's rational for us to do it. But better and worse are value judgments. I don't know why you don't see that. You know, the thing about well-being but, but, is that but, but, so people have, let put me just your hand one point. on a hot stove and then tell me that if it was in order, if my goal was 
a broader goal and putting my hand on a hot stove would help me with that broader goal. I'd put my hand on a hot stove and deal with the suckiness of the feeling. But, but the it, thing is, it's, it's not to, to say that to say that the worst possible misery for everyone is bad is a value judgment is to say nothing. Well, you're, that, you're that accepting a particular doesn't... definition of well-being. The, fo- the point is no, that no, psychology any, any, people no, no, have no, 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 I'm different not, definitions. I'm not, you're, just, you're just not understanding my claim. Take any definition. Take, take, let's, let's take imagine, value fulfillment as a definition, which is a let, new let's, definition. Let's imagine a universe of, of radical pl- pluralism with respect to values, mm-hmm. right? So we've, we've got – is that we've got a, we've got a place over here where you have you have perfectly matched sadists and masochists. Who if you could just get them together, they get really really happy, right? But we we want nothing to do with any of that, right? Mm-hmm. It's like that just sounds like hell to us. But the truth is, psychologically for them, they're having a fine old time in their you know BDSM dungeon, uh, and uh, we have no idea how weird all that can get. But it's just different values, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and let's say there's a functional inf- infinity, uh, a functionally infinite number of, of value systems. I'm asking you to imagine a universe where every conscious creature, by its own values, is made as miserable as it possibly can be. So everything is tortured, even if your torture is my highest enjoyment, and vice versa. D- grab whatever knobs there are and turn them down to, to the hell realms for everybody. For as long as possible, right? With nothing good coming of it. If something good's coming of it, well, then that's just not as bad as things can get. Let's make them worse, right? Everything gets dialed down to the utmost misery by whatever uh, causal structure would allow for that misery. And it's so. So if you're going to flip the flip all the 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 valences on a value system in some other corner of the universe, well, then okay, that's the antimatter of morality over there. Well, fine. Um, it functions by its own principles. Let's let's screw let's screw things up perfectly over there. That's the play. That's the base case, right? So if you're going to say, well, that's just a value judgment that the worst possible misery for everyone is bad, I don't know what you're talking about. You're just you're making you're making noises. You're, that it don't, feels like you're inserting track. in ought. You're only getting to is to ought because you're inserting an ought with the is. You're no, pairing them I'm, together. I, I'm I'm granting I'm granting you there's no such thing as ought. We live in a universe without oughts. You don't have to do anything. You you shouldn't do anything. <laughs> okay? You're just you're 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 off scot free. You're off the hook. There's Scott no morality. Free. Yes. Yeah. There's no morality, you know, Johnny philosopher, right? Okay. Okay. So we're 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 in a universe where you don't <laughs> you don't ha- you don't have to get out of bed, right? You don't have to get out of bed in the morning. Okay. I'm not gonna judge you. <clears throat> How are right? facts going to at all the, lead me to action? The fa- the facts are that there there are very different experiences on offer here, and you will helplessly find yourself preferring the good day at Esalen over the the rat filled dungeon. Just to take the the fairly parochial differences that we but, can notice here but on earth. Good can only be used in relationship to a goal. How are you divorcing mm-hmm. it from the goal? No, it, it, it's 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 you disagree it's, with uh, that? it's basic, well no it's no because there's just there's just the 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 um the valence of certain experiences within consciousness that, that have no necessary reference to a goal. It's like it, it, you, right. can, you can you ta- can you can you can be so happy or unhappy that it has no reference point in past or future, right? Like you can have the best possible acid trip or the worst possible acid trip, and you're not. There's no goal there. There's just a, a the the sheer extremis of your physiology pushed to the breaking point. I do think that there's pleasurable, there's unpleasant, but I don't think they map to, on to good or bad. In the way that well, you kind of, you well, seem give, like you're mapping give, them onto each them, other. Give them enough, to dial them up enough, and give them enough time, right? Like, what, what if, what if existence was just that? What if existence? What if there was a way to, to, to? There was a place you could be. Let's say, let's say reincarnation is true, right? Let's say that's a possibility. And wouldn't that be interesting? Be, if it was yeah, true. That, would, that would that would be interesting. I mean, uh, the truth is both. 
both situations are interesting. You know, there's, yeah. you know, getting that's true. Getting non-existence is also. I mean, the fact that you know it it you appear and then you disappear and you really disappear. That is also interesting. So it's, it's a little, it's a little, it's a little it's like trippy. the firm. It's the Fermi problem. You know, it's like yeah. the, thinking of a universe teeming with other life forms and advanced civilizations. That is that is about the most astonishing possibility yeah. on offer, except if you think that there's no one else in the universe, that is also astonishing. I mean, they're both they're both just jaw, jaw dropping to think about. Um, but if you could be reborn in a state of perfect bliss, uncomplicated, uncomplicated by any goals, right? Um, that 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 may not be the the most interesting possibility for you, but maybe your intuitions about it that cause you to think it's not the most interesting possibility are just born of your own, you know, glitch in your own code. Whereas if we could change that, if we could change those intuitions. Let's say we just perform the necessary, you know, brain changes for you. Um, a little slightly, you know, maybe maybe analogous to teaching me how to play the cello. All of a sudden, I would appreciate. You're like, I don't know what I'm missing with with respect to classical music. But once you once you gave me the intuitions of a of a Beethoven, well, all of a sudden I'd recognize. Okay, this is there was a there there. This is just you know the person I was, the Philistine I was, who just didn't get it and who'd rather listen to Led Zeppelin, just didn't know what he was missing. Right. My my point is with respect to the moral realism here is that. Just as it is with any other realistic claim about knowledge, about facts, you know, with physics or anything else, it is possible in the moral domain not to know what you're missing, right? You don't know how good or bad things are over there, right? You don't even know there is an over there based on your own experience, right? And um, when we, we're asking questions about how to navigate in this space of possible experience and whether it would be good or bad to, to, go, to go one direction or another, we are constrained based on our own moral intuitions rather often, but we can, we can triangulate on those and recognize that we're, you know, we're, we're, we're living in a universe where it could be possible to change one's moral intuitions. In fact, it is possible based on pedagogy and and you know, it's just collisions with other people who have different intuitions, you know, through conversation. Um, but ultimately, ultimately, might be possible to change them very directly. Like we're going to change the, your actual co the code you're running on your brain, um, or we're going to upload you into a different brain, right? Like like that's yeah. like so. Like what what sort of robot do you want to be once we once we can really change you materially? Um, there's this further question of Okay, if I can change your intuitions about right and wrong and good and evil, right? So that up is up is down and down is up, right? There's this further question of asking, would it be good to do that? Well, whose whose intuitions are you referencing by by when you even ask that question? Like, who's going to decide whether it's good to do that? Well, again, we're, we're we have to fall back on this original navigation problem. There's this moral landscape. There's a functionally infinite number of experiences on offer, but you know, probably, almost certainly not infinite, but but functionally so. Um, and we know that some of these experiences suck, right? It's just built into the very logic of of of, of this case, which is, whatever your intuitions are, we can concoct an experience that is maximally terrible for you, right? Whatever your however your mind is built. We can make you suffer, right? So, getting away from if we should do anything, if if the word should is going to mean anything, if the word good is going to mean anything, is if the word better is going to mean anything, if a valence toward the positive is going to mean anything, getting away from the burning stove that is burning everyone in the worst possible mode of burning that their you know their organization can admit of forever, right? Getting away from that is good and better and so worth I, doing. I agree, and I think and that you should it, do it. I, but I only agree with you because I share your value system. No, no, no. In, over there, your whatever your value system is, its ultimate repudiation is part of this picture. You're if you are capable of wanting anything, 
you're going to want to be elsewhere once I get you into the worst possible misery for everyone. That, I feel it doesn't and, take a lot of and, and, and more that takes a lot of hubris though for us to think that we and, and know the right more way. Important, more important, it, this is this is where the this is where the double standard I referenced earlier comes into the picture. People seem to think that a diversity of opinion or disagreement on values, on moral values, yeah. has to mean something when it doesn't mean anything when we're talking about scientific values or facts. Okay, the guy who shows up at the physics conference who doesn't care about causality and doesn't care about consistency and doesn't care about logic and doesn't care about the, the history of physics and all the conversations that were had before he got there and doesn't know the math and doesn't he's just not adequate to the conversation doesn't get to be part of the conversation. The psychopath doesn't get to inform our ethics. The Taliban don't get a vote. They don't know what it means to live a good life and produce a good society and treat women well. They're imbeciles. They have a shitty culture. We know this. This is not, and, and it shouldn't be taboo to say this. They're, they're, they're trying to live by the lights of a fifth century book or seventh century book, um, which wasn't a good book even in the seventh century, right? It was... It, it, so it's like by the lights of the seventh century, it was possible to do better than what Muhammad managed, morally speaking. It was right? probably a good book. And, in and its so time. it is with the Bible. And so it is with the Book of Mormon, right? The book, like, you know, if you're going to hold the Book of Mormon up as a history of the world or a history of anything else or a book about physics or a book about medicine, it sucks. It also sucks as a moral orientation in the 21st century. Right. It just it's like we, we can do better than all of these things. And we want to have an open ended conversation about the nature of reality. We do not have to be constrained by this, this spurious notion that values are something other than facts. They're not, like, the, yeah, there's a way of talking about them that, that can seem to, that they can, they can motivate that distinction for the purposes of certain conversations. But it's, it's like the distinction between reason and emotion, right? It's like, yes, there's, there's they're not they're not precisely the same thing. We know what it's like to have motivated reasoning where your emotion is causing you to misconstrue certain arguments or 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 cherry pick certain data or whatever it is because you you know you want things to come out a certain way, right? Like yes, reason and emotion are are uh, you know part of a Venn diagram that don't completely overlap. But it's also true that part that that there's a an emotional aspect to our to the cognitive apparatus that is producing our rationality. And if you and if you're damaged emotionally in the right ways, if you have, you know, orbital medial prefrontal damage that causes you not to feel the implications of certain reasoning strategies or certain correct uh, conclusions, you will you will malfunction. You'll 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 know what's right and and be unable to use what's right, you know, rationally speaking, you know, to, to reference Antonio Damasio's work on on gambling tasks there, or um, and and even just the even just the feeling of doubt is an emotion. The feeling of certainty is an emotion. The feeling of 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 aha, now I see how that adds up. Like two plus two makes four. I get it. There that is leveraging emotion in order to land rationally. Right, like there's, it's not, it's not, it's not completely devoid. It's, it's not, it's not unemotional, and so it's, it's it, on some level, it's a spurious. It's not an entirely clear distinction, and we we have to be careful in in how we differentiate reason and emotion, um, and it's it is to a certain purpose, but so but the uh, and so and, and so it is with values. It's like yeah, you can't you you can't do arithmetic. Without valuing the, the, you know, the the operations in certain ways, like if if you're going to do arithmetic, or pretend to do arithmetic, and imagine that you should be free to think of the numbers differently on either side of an, the equal sign, right? Two means two over here, but it means something different over here. That's what I value. I, I don't. I'm. I. You know. I don't like your colonialist, you know, mansplaining, 
white guy values of consistency across the equal sign, mm -hmm. you know, you, that got drummed into you in your, in your um, uh, private school. But over here in my, you know, Taliban funded academy of arithmetic, we've got, you know, or my, my, you know, where we read uh, Derrida and, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, Foucault on the topic of arithmetic, and we realize this is just a socially constructed project. And on the other side of the equal sign, we can we can have left arithmetic and right arithmetic. I mean, I'm just obviously I'm just making this up. I'm just confabulating. But what like that's not going to produce the results that we that we we dignify as arithmetic um, for very obvious reasons. And values are built into that project. Now, again, this gets subverted in specific instances in very interesting ways, which we which we also have to to enshrine into our values, right? So for instance, and it's a little bit like how intuition is is at bedrock for us, but it's constantly being subverted by the systems we build to leverage our intuitions. Like you have to have you, Two, the only way you understand two plus two makes four is is based on intuition, but we know our intuitions fail in other areas of mathematics, and we have to we have to account for that. But you know, so you can take something like like what I just said that the kind of arithmetic that would be impossible and 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 laughable. There, we we know we can find ourselves in in case, in situations where that seems to be so and it isn't right. Like when someone poses. Non it proposes non non Euclidean geometry for the first time, right? You have you know, a mathematician like uh, Riemann, I believe, was you know was certainly one of the first people to to do this. Like everyone thought that a a, a triangle had to have 180 degrees, and here comes somebody saying, no, no, I'm not going to play by those rules. Uh, not all triangles have 180 degrees. Okay. There, there's 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 one time point where he seems like a, a lunatic, or at least he just doesn't understand what he's saying. But there is a path from from that initial seemingly crazy claim to making sense increment incrementally, and there's just not that many increments here, where then you think, oh my God, unless everyone understands what this guy just said, they don't understand geometry anymore, right? Like so, like it goes from this is blasphemy and you're an idiot to you're a genius. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. And we know what it's like to traverse that boundary. And we know, and, and we know that there's principles of intellectual honesty and self-criticism and openness to evidence and argument and patience and, 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 and being sensitive to bias. We know all of, we, we know what we need to have in the toolkit and we know we get continually surprised by new discoveries, uh, and the fact that someone like Riemann can come along and say, okay, look, a triangle on a, on a curved surface is going to have more or less than, than, than 180 degrees, yeah. right? Do you understand what I'm talking about? And, that, and the point lands. We know that is a different project than postmodern, you know, everything's, everything's pure context, r relativistic bullshit. We know it's different than the Taliban may be right that the Quran is the perfect word of the creator of the universe and it should subsume every other human project. We, we, we know enough to know the, the kinds of errors that are being made there. And um, so it's just it's like the, the exceptions, you know, the, 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 those the, those exceptions where everybody's wrong and then suddenly some lone genius rewrites our collective appraisal of reality. That do, that needn't open the door to this this you know quasi nihilistic picture that every doubter who comes along needs to be taken seriously, right? The person who doesn't understand that the worst possible misery for everyone is worth avoiding, just doesn't get to come to the conference on morality. You're just doesn't belong there. So many good points, and you make a lot of good points in the moral landscape, but none of that. Uh, is countering the naturalistic fallacy, which is simply says you can't have 
um, you can't have only factual premises. You have to have something well, that has no, a, no. Right? But I, I am, I'm, I'm agreeing. I'm agreeing okay. with that. Even okay. when you only have factual premises, you can't get okay. to a fact without first presupposing certain values. You just can't, like, because if you don't value not contradicting the last thing you claim to believe, right? Mm. If you want your beliefs to cohere, I see what you're saying. That's a value. I can't both like to believe that something is red and something is also blue, you know, red and blue all over, right? Not partly red and partly blue, but it's red and it's blue, right? Is a contradiction. Um, I I can so I could decide. Uh, I have to have a value system to organize that those two propositions. Right. I mean, either I'm. I'm I don't think care that's true. That Let me give you a good example, a counterexample, and you tell me if this is not a counter. I hated IQ tests. I hated intelligence uh, research. Um, I went into the field with the mission because of my values to take down IQ. But I collected the facts to such a, I, I had put my values aside as much as I possibly could. And I studied with the leading IQ researcher in the world, Nicholas McIntosh at University of Cambridge. And I published studies which directly contradicted my whole experience as a child. And it, it was hard for me to stomach, but I still published it because I had a commitment to the truth. Now, oh, no, no, but okay, yeah. that, what that commitment to, to the truth is a statement of your your more value basic system, values. value system of commit you, truth you, trumped you, my value system of wanting to yes. change the intelligence field in a, by taking down IQ. So I had exactly. two competing yeah. values. That is what that's what you're arguing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, your value. Yes, we we need to identify the values that scale best that that can help. Oh, so. We, we need to identify the, the intellectual and ethical values that allow for the, the again, the, the sanest and most efficient way of navigating in this space of all possible experience toward better and better, more creative, more insightful, more beautiful experiences, which we are right to care about if we're right to care about anything, mm. right? If caring, I mean, this is... This is where where language bites its own tail, right? It's like this is this is where the the definitions of terms become circular, right? Like for someone to say, okay, what if I want to experience the worst possible misery for everyone, right? That's not a use of the word want that makes any sense, right? What what you mean by want doesn't map onto this landscape. Right. So like like we have to like words, people, this is what's happening with the is ought problem. People are pretending to think certain thoughts. They're not actually thinking them. They think they're thinking them, but they, they, they think that uttering a sentence is the same thing as thinking a thought. It isn't right. I can I can pretend to think this thought. You know what I have in my refrigerator right now? I have a round square, yeah. right? Per, it's a sentence, right? It's utter bullshit. It has no reference point logically or empirically in our universe or, or any other that I can imagine because round square makes no sense, right? It is the round is exactly what a square isn't. Right. So the fact that I can say the phrase round square doesn't shouldn't make you think that I'm 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 tracking the thought. The, 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 there's a thought on offer that my that 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 my mind isn't passing through. It's like here every thought every every sentence is a it's like a needle that that needs to actually think it through. You need to be able to thread the needle, right? But I'm not threading it. I'm just saying here's a needle and and uh, and I'm pretending that my my intelligence has has passed through the the eye of that needle by by uttering the sentence. But it's it's a completely empty, it's completely vacuous. It is not a thought. Right? I'm not thinking that thought. That and that's not a paradox. I'm I'm making small mouth noises and pretending to be a philosopher when I say that sentence, yeah. right? That's what's happening 
with this is ought distinction, in my view. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, it's just it is it is empty language when you actually drill down on the circumstance we're actually in, right? And what and and the way our intuitions allow us to make any claim at all cognitively uh, or, or 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 behaviorally a, a behavior and a, a, to feel any motive to do anything right it's like what it, what is it to be a, a cognitively and volitionally alive system um we we are we we're hurling words at this circumstance trying to 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 make some appraisal of it and to make and and again you know whether we th to choose to think of it or not we're trying to navigate within this space of possible experiences like i feel something that makes me uncomfortable and i want to stop feeling that way right with my apish brain and part you might of not this, but you might not want to stop feeling that way if you had a certain value system that allowed well, that to okay, happen right but then i but then other things count as uncomfortable in that value system Right. So like I've got I've got whatever I've got that I can't I can I can't perfectly inspect. In fact, I'm really bad at inspecting it. Right. I can't look inside myself and find my values. They have to come out in dialogue with the world. Right. They they get they get revealed to me as 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 they get revealed to you by these collisions, you know, linguistic collisions and behavioral collisions with the world. Like, how do you know you don't like your hand on a hot stove? Well, touch one for the first time. Right. And then, you know, um, how do you know you're allergic to strawberries? You know, you, you eat them for the first time and you have a reaction. How do you how do you know you don't you you want to reject the inconsistency in this other person's argument? Like like someone's telling you something that isn't adding up. Right. You're in your first philosophy philosophy class and you've got some. Um, Anti-natalist arguing that it would, it would be better better not to have been alive, right? It'd be better not to be born, and having kids is totally unethical for that reason because life sucks. Um, and you you feel like oh, there's got to be something wrong with this argument because I, it's like it's it seems uh, it just seems to open the door to all kinds of things I, that that seem starkly unethical, like which is which is to say that if you could kill everyone in their sleep tonight painlessly, that would be a good thing to do. Right. Let's, let's just murder everyone in their sleep tonight. There'd be no one bereaved. No one would be suffering any of the, the outcomes of that. And there'd be no attendant suffering to the deaths themselves. Like that's just it. Let's let's if you could do that, you'd be a moral monster not to do that. That's sort of the, 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 the sorry. I'm uncomfortable with that. Um, this is all kind of revealed values. And then you get especially uncomfortable when someone says something which amounts to two plus two equals five. Like, OK, OK. That's bullshit. We scan your brain while you're doing all of that, and we see you're using some of the same neural structures that you use when you find, you know, certain smells disgusting, right? Because there is no other areas of the brain to leverage to have these kinds of reactions. Because you're a you're an ape after all. I right? like how you put that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so where you're, you're using a very old toolkit to, to you know, evol in evolutionary in evolutionary terms to to do any of these th higher cognitive things. Yeah. So we're navigating, but then, the, but we, but we, the truth is, we have enough that is abstract and not merely conforming to the appetites born of evolution, uh, that allows us to to take something like the view from nowhere to stand outside ourselves, where we can say, okay, yeah, we're just apes now, we're just you know these these these. Uh, these warm and moist and and uh, meaty things that that crave certain certain outcomes, but here we have we have we have this language game that is that is getting interesting enough that seems to promise that we can stand outside of this if only for you know between the hours of nine and five in a, in a at a place like M MIT or Harvard or Stanford or some institution that, for whatever reason, has carved out enough free time and you know to to put the you know our twenty watts of brain power 
toward toward problems that aren't immediately relevant to to feeding ourselves and not dying. Yeah. And we can have a conversation that seems to look back on this creaturely circumstance of being mere apes, you know, try not to die. And we can say, what should we do when we can rewrite the firmware of our nervous systems and do anything we want? What will be right to want under those conditions? When I can change your moral intuitions and I could make you a happy member of the Taliban, if you want to be that, mm -hmm. Should you want to be that when I can make you someone who recognizes how shitty it is to be a happy member of the Taliban? And where where can we stand? And what does this moral relativism seem to promise? In my view, it promises this moral landscape, which is, okay, now let's finally admit we have a navigation problem. And part of our compass is – and and, and – Part of the problem of solving uh, this this navigation problem is recognizing that now we can make changes to our compass itself, right? It's not just reading the true north of I'm an ape born on Earth that feels certain a, a certain dopamine rush. Amazing. Uh, this is why that? this is – what you're saying is amazing because it's precisely that metacognition and mindfulness that you're exhibiting that I think gives us a species – gives us free will. Okay, but it's amazing. All, you're but illust them, you're illustrating you know, exactly the, the what I've been. The reason arguing. why it's not free will is because all of it is being pushed from behind causally, either deterministically or randomly or both, such that such such that every momentary instance of do, of of navigating and doing anything at all, again, just me getting to the end of this sentence, right? Yeah, is fundamentally mysterious, being driven from from behind, and. No matter no, if I if I maintain my current course or I change it, both are inscrutable. If I pick up the glass of water with my left hand or my right hand, both either is inscrutable. If I decide to suddenly want to learn to play the cello, that change in me is an absolute mystery, which I cannot account for. That's all I besides cannot, the I, point. That's all besides the point. The thing that's really the, interesting here the point because it's totally compatible with with determinism. And, and free will is not compatible with real determinism because if, if you could say to someone, listen, the movie of your li life has already been shot and scored, edited, it's done, right? We, there's a place to stand from which we know exactly what you're going to say two years from now to your wife in this conversation where you think you're having some kind of epiphany, yeah. you know, that's already written. We wrote it. We have the dialogue on our supercomputer, right? Our lives are compatible with that. Our phenomenology, our, our moment to moment phenomenology is compatible with that. I'm not saying that's true. I'm not saying randomness isn't part of the picture. I'm saying our experience is totally compatible with that. And to, to recognize that experientially changes things. It feels different. It fe and, and, it, and it has moral implications. And it closes the door to hatred, in real hatred, and it does not close the door to love, and it cl and it makes you someone who can com stand completely free of of certain forms of psychological suffering that seem to be an imperative if you don't experience your mind that way. It's so uh, funny how so, so much of this is semantic because I. I'm like right on board with your your whole life project. I can see so clearly the thread that unites all these. You know, we talked about religion. You know, and getting the, and and the is all all this stuff. You know, you want to pull back the curtain and um, have us derive values from some universal base of truth and reality, as opposed to deriving values from some belief that's cockamamie, as my grandmother mm -hmm. would say. I totally am on board with all this. I could see semantically. I'm not going to convince you some of these things, but it's funny because I. I love your project and your mindfulness. I, I am a subscriber to the waking up. I, I listened to your morning meditation today. <laughs> and, and, and my, as a human being myself in the, in the, my own teachings with my own courses, I teach a transcend course and all this is very much in line with what you're teaching, which is helping us to ascertain the reality of our mind and understand our patterns and in order so we can have that potential to change in our lifetime. To me, the kind of stuff you're working on, the mindfulness, the uh, metacognition, driving values from facts, to me, that's worth calling 
free will at, from a human perspective. But well, so so I mean, freedom freedom is definitely something to value and to aspire to in all of its guises, right? So like, so yeah. I, you know, I, I think, you know, if someone, and again, this is all, this can be as, as, uh, uh, transcendental or as, or as prosaic as you want it to be. But it's, uh, you know, if you just take freedom in the, in the context of any goal, like, a, like if you want to lose weight, it's better to feel the, the, the kind of free access to the internal resources that will allow you to do that with with a, with the, the minimum amount of suffering, right? It's like you're not constantly racked by by uh, irreconcilable impulses. Like you want to lose weight, but you're desperate to eat chocolate, and then you eat the chocolate and you feel guilty. Like like and you cycle back and forth between that, and then you don't make any progress. And six months have passed, and you're the same weight, and yet you spent you know, thousands of dollars on, you know, to join diet clubs, like you're, you're frustrated, like all of that is not as good as having your, your capacities and your aspirations truly aligned where it's like, okay, I've made a decision. I want to lose weight. I know how to do that. I got to eat at a caloric deficit. I got to work out more. And I'm going to do that without, without any sense of internal conflict. And it's just going to be a source of joy for me. And the pounds are just going to drop, just, just fall off hour by hour. You know, I mean, literally, there's not going to be an hour over the next three months where I'm not going to be losing some amount of weight. I'm going to be happy the whole time. And three months from now, I'm going to look in the mirror or look at the scale and realize I've achieved my goal without any impediment. Right. Th those are two possible experiences. Freedom is a concept that that uh, is useful to differentiate those two two experiences, right? I'm, you know, in one case, I'm free to just follow my own advice without conflict and follow the advice of others, and to 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 um, not be coerced by my own internal cravings and addictions. And it's like I'm I'm not addicted. I'm 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 free of uh, of uh, those kinds of impulses. Um, but again, I just I think there's something misleading about invoking this traditional concept of free will because I know where people are starting. People are starting – it's the same problem with self. Like I, there are ways to talk mm -hmm. about – there's a ways to use the word self that I – you know, that are unavoidable. I mean, I, you, you know, there's no, no problem in talking about oneself or the self. But what most people most of the time mean by the feeling of self is referring to something that is illusory, that is a source of real suffering. Right. It is the feeling of being a subject in the middle of experience. And when you lose that feeling, I mean, this is, you know, it's not, uh, you know, uh, this is why this is a good analogy. It's actually, it's the same. It's just more than an analogy. When you lose that feeling, you also lose the feeling to which this notion of free will can be attached. Right. Like that's, that's where it's like, it's obvious that there's nothing in experience to which that would refer. It's like it's obvious that the next thought simply arises. There's no other way for it to appear. And I didn't think it before I thought it. And I am in some I, – I'm I'm, I may be the first to know, to know what it is, but I'm also the last to know what it is. It's like it's <laughs> – it's, it's, and even with something like speech, it's like I'm – unless I've prepared my speech in advance or unless I have a script – I I'm hearing what I say at the same time you're hearing it. Right. Yeah. It's like, I mean, they, again, there's, there's some Delta here. I mean, there's some, uh, uh, granted there are kinds of speech acts where it's not totally scripted, but it's sort of, you know, I have some internal sense of where I'm going as I'm going there. But, but rather often it's just, you know, if I'm thinking of an analogy, if we're talking and I think, well, just imagine you're, uh, you know, Imagine the old story of putting rice on, you know, one grain of rice on each square of a chessboard and you double double each time. And by the time you get to the end, of the like, like I just thought of that old, you know, yeah. uh, story. I didn't I didn't think of it. I mean, it's not the greatest example because I sort of thought of it before the words got out. But, you know, there's just you and I are hearing my thoughts at the same time for the most part, mm -hmm. when I'm speaking. And 
my thoughts aren't evidence of your free will, right? Like they're just right. appearing, right? And that's what's happening for me too. And the impulse, again, if I'm going to go for the glass of water, like for a moment ago, I wasn't thinking of water, wasn't feeling anything about the water. I wasn't thirsty. I would, but now I thought, oh, it might be nice to have a, a sip of water. That came out of nowhere, out of nowhere. And but that link between thought and action is not one to one. You know, there's a really interesting paper on do smokers have free will, and that's the Baumeister, Roy Baumeister paper. And he found mm -hmm. that in almost every case, people overestimated the extent to which they wouldn't be able to quit or they wouldn't be able to have free will based on the urge. But it turns out that humans have much more self-control than they realize that they're capable of. You know, you don't have to, obviously, you don't have to, you know, you can want the water. But if you if you suddenly activate your prefrontal cortex, you could override that and be like, you know what, I'm going to wait. But again, it's subjective. So I'm not denying that, again, there's, there, there's a difference between voluntary and involuntary action. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between behavioral self-control and lacking that capacity. Right. Like, let's say I have goals, you know, to, you know, to stop, but my goal is to stop smoking, but I'm completely incapable of not smoking. Right. That's one way to be. The, the other way to be is I have a goal to stop smoking and I can actually veto the impulse to stop smoking when it comes online. Right. For the time it takes me to actually kick the habit. Yeah. Um, but that's not, again, every instance of this. Like, let's say I'm, you know, I'm trying to stop smoking and I, I'm able to successfully preempt the impulse to smoke on Tuesday afternoon, but Wednesday morning I reach for a cigarette and smoke, but I only take one puff and then I throw it away. Like every bit of that, the, 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 the sufficiency of my, my uh, strength of will in one case, my weakness of will in another case, the fact that it wasn't so weak that I smoked the whole cigarette in that case, every bit of it is being determined by states of my brain, which I didn't author, which I didn't create, to which but I'm- still the, you. It's the still you. The consequences to it, but, it, but my liver is still me and it gives me absolutely no sense of free will. If my liver stops, fun, my liver is working exactly the way it is in this moment yeah. and no other way, yeah. If it works better tomorrow or stops working completely on Friday, yeah. I am a mere victim of those changes or witness to their consequences. It's there's not it's not within the domain of my of my autonomy I or agency. You. I hear I get and, that but, point. And, yeah. But so it is with states of my brain. So it is with each instance of neurochemistry in my brain. And yet that is producing everything I experience, right? Including my preferences and my goals and my, my impulses that are in conformity with preferences and goals. And then my sudden subversion of those goals with some alternate impulse, you know, the thought, oh God, wouldn't it be great to have a cigarette right now? <laughs> that's, that's getting piped up from below and I'm the one who, who can... Error correct. Seem, seem to offer the antidote. Yeah. I can seem to say, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to follow that thought. I've been taught mindfulness uh, by, by Sam, Sam and Scott, yeah. right? But the fact that that comes online in that moment and doesn't in another, right, that's mm -hmm. mysterious. The fact that it comes online to the degree that it does and not one degree further is also mysterious. It's probably dependent on other things that seem completely adventitious to my character, like whether I got enough sleep the night before, or whether I had a full lunch, or whether the you know, uh, whether I I got enough sunlight. I mean, like there's just who knows. It's not all, like all totally the mysterious. Out. Like I'm an absurdist, so I I I love a lot what you're saying because I will see things that I do and I'm like, but I'm like, oh, that was really kind of predictable that I would do that. But, you know, it's not totally mysterious if we have an understanding of psychology about how genes work. You know, I kind of get why I'm, I have the dopamine drive. You know, I get what's pumping through my head. I can kind of understand it from a mechanistic level, right? It's not like totally no, but, uh, like but, but shocking. Understand, yeah. Well, under, no, I get. I guess it's, it's descriptively – in certain cases, it's descriptively not mysterious at all. I mean we know right. ca causally uh, we can tell a story about it. But again, there's just two different levels of – 
of connecting to the phenomenology here. When I say mysterious, I mean like, like I can move my hand, right? This is the most, this is the, one of the most prosaic things about me that I can move my hand. Like yeah. I can do this. I have no insight into how I do this, right? If I suddenly couldn't do it, yes, that would be flabbergasting. But the fact that I can do it is also flabbergasting. I have no, in, literally no insight. Now, I know something about the neurology of this, right? I can talk about muscle fibers and, you know, actin and, and you know, the transduction in, in, in motor nerves and, you know, acetylcholine. And like, it's, I, I, I can, I can. You kind of get it. it. You get I it. Vomit my concepts yeah. Yeah. onto this experience, right? Yeah. None of that reaches in to the experience. None of it, right? So like, like, like this is this is irreducibly mysterious. You know, that's interesting because some people have argued that autistic savants actually are an exception to all this, and they actually can get inside the module, you know, in a very deep way that most of us can't. That's why I wish I knew what the quality of an autistic savant was because I talked to the late Daryl Treffert. Uh, he was a dear mm-hmm. friend of mine. He was a you know Rain Man scientific advisor. He studied. He spent his whole life studying these people. And it's interesting because it seems like some of those autistic capacities, like to be able to just verbatim play back um, something, actually requires the ability to get into the module consciously in some way that is not privy to the rest of us. So I think there's actually some really interesting neuroscientific uh, exceptions to some of this. Well, well, I wouldn't say – so I'm not saying that you can't have – more and more fine-grained insight into the experience, right? It's so like like right. like you can learn to pay en- enough attention to anything, a motor, a simple motor experience like moving your hand, right. and it can break down into you know it can become pi- pixelated in ways that are are interesting, right? So you can you can become more sensitive to the 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 link between mind and body. I mean, like, like the, the arising of intention and kind of it having a kind of threshold effect that actually does, you know, trigger a motor program. Um, you can become more sensitive to things we know to be factually true. Like if you touch a hot stove, you can actually experience the reflex component of withdrawing your hand so that you actually withdrew it before you felt the pain, Hmm. right? Like the, you know, the, the road to the amygdala is actually faster than the sensory, the road to sensory cortex that actually registered the conscious percept of, oh my God, that's too hot, right? Yeah. So you can you can notice that you can actually become sensitive enough to notice that first you withdrew your hand and then you felt the pain of how hot it was, right? Um, so I'm not saying you can't have any insight into this, but there is still something, however deep you go into anything, However atomized your experience consciously becomes of yeah. a phenomenon, there is just simply this fact that first something wasn't there and then it's there. There's yeah. a there's a, I mean, you can you can shatter your 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 uh, subjective experience down to its atoms and notice that things are just appearing out of the darkness. Right, sights, sounds, sensations, thoughts, intentions, emotions, or their micro constituents, insofar as you can find those with your attention. Right. And and, and again, yeah. things can get incredibly pixelated when you're doing when you spend months on retreat doing nothing but pay attention to to mostly sensory perception, it breaks down, it can break down into especially if you're if you're doing it strategically in, in, in the particular way so as to look for its its kind of smallest and briefest aspects, mm. which is one style of meditation, things become amazingly pixelated and your body like you don't you don't feel that you have a body anymore. You have a cl- you know a cloud of sensation, you know, of of temperature and, and pressure and and movement that is just and does you know doesn't have the shape of a body at all, right? Like you don't feel hand, you feel these this, these these um, micro changes of, of of primary sensation at each, each moment, um, but again, whatever you're noticing is there, and then it's not there, and then it's, something else is there, and then it's not there. It's all and inspiring. You you are not doing any of it. That's the crucial point. You, the one who's witnessing, 
aren't doing but, any of it. But you can do something about it. <laughs> well, That's the point I'm trying to make. Well, well, <laughs> but whether or not you do in the next moment is just as mysterious as the okay. sound of a bird I out get your the point. window. Yeah, I see what you're saying. It is. Look, let's end. Uh, but you're you're testing my limits of, sp- of free will right now because I'm starving. Um, yeah. But I and I'm sure you must be as well. Um, I want to just agree with you that it's all inspiring. I walk yes. around constantly in a state of awe and wonder. That's my default mode is curiosity um, about everything, about people I'm supposed to hate. I'm actually just I witness them just like I would right. witness my consciousness. So I'm with you on a lot of that. I really can't thank you enough for coming on today, spending four freaking hours with me covering almost everything about human existence. Um, And I would still say to be continued because there, I didn't get to the Twitter questions. I didn't get to the mindfulness thing. I'm not saying we have to do it. Like you come back to my podcast, but I just suspect we'll talk again someday. You know what I mean? Conversation will continue. Yeah. 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 Well, it's been a pleasure, Scott. So thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks Thanks for listening to this episode of the psychology podcast. Do you have a million questions after listening? Are you dying to have a discussion about something Sam Harris said about free will and the naturalistic fallacy? Come join the Psychology Podcast After Party over on the Stereo app this Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific Time, where best-selling author AJ Jacobs and I will be discussing the episode. In fact, AJ and I go live every Sunday, and we love having discussions with fellow psychology enthusiasts. You can join our show, ask questions about anything you want, and share your experiences and opinions about the podcast. Last week, we were so impressed with the listener questions. For example, here's a snippet of a question from last week that we found fascinating. Gentlemen, I agree with you that consciousness cannot arise from the cosmic dust of the universe. But as you know, we are also part of the cosmic dust from the universe and all of our cells. I do not think it beyond God's scope to help create us from the atoms and the dust of the universe so that we, when we finally have an awakening, realize that we are not only linked to the people on the planet, but linked to the universe that the planet exists in. God thinks in multidimensional ways. As he said, we will not know his understand, we will not understand his knowledge, but we need to keep our minds open and expand our own and realize that the more we are linked to each other, from the womb to the tomb, we are bound to care for each other. Thank you. Download the Stereo app now and follow me at Stereo.com slash psychpodcast and join AJ and I live this week. Download the Stereo app now and follow me at Stereo.com slash psychpodcast and join AJ Jacobs and I live this week. You can also get the link in the show notes. See you there, and stay tuned for more podcast episodes on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.